everybody. Today I have a guest I am super excited about. I've been wanting to talk to him for a while about the situation in Israel, and luckily he decided to come on. We have Hillel Fold here today. He's a tech columnist. He's brilliant. He's been working in tech for years now, and on that end of things, I, I know him quite well as well. But uh, when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, he's quite brilliant there too. So thank you for coming on and uh, being willing to talk today. Sure. I think it's funny how we connected randomly on the internet. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy what social media can do nowadays. I mean, uh, just for everyone watching, the the way Hillel and I connected was uh, because I had made a post after October 7th about reconnecting with my Judaism uh, and how I grew up. Obviously, look at me, you know, not the most Jewish guy in the world. and Not the, uh, most, not the most observant, maybe, but you are as Jewish as I am. Yes, that's the right way to put it. But, you know, I always struggled with faith, if we're being honest, and uh, the faith aspect of things. And, uh, you know, it seems like it resonated, and it was nice. He said, uh, I want to give this guy a hug. But, you know, maybe one day, at least now, we're, <laughs> we're having a conversation. Sounds good. Um, so, you know, to start off, I, I just want to hear what October 7th meant to you. And uh, I just want to preface this, you know, by saying that you've experienced personal tragedy in your own family in the past through terrorism in Israel. And so I can only imagine October 7th compounded that, uh, but I just want to hear your thoughts on everything. Yeah. So you're spot on. Uh, you know, uh, I think, I think when a person ex experiences trauma, um, like a brother losing a brother to terror, um, you know, I could speak for myself and say that every time there's a terrorist attack, it triggers the hell out of me. Um, I have very low tolerance, you know, to hear about atrocities or details of, you know, terrorist attacks. It, it puts me in a really dark place. Um, and, you know, obviously I was in synagogue October 7th morning and the rumor started spreading, but none of us had our phones because we don't use our phones on, on holidays. And so we didn't really have any confirmation about what was happening. Uh, we knew it was bad, though, because everyone was getting called up to the army, etc. So um, I didn't really know what to expect, but. Obviously, no one in their wildest imagination expected it to be that bad. Uh, but yeah, it, you know, it, it threw me into a very, very dark place. Uh, I've yet, even now, like when I, when someone starts talking to me about the atrocities or if someone sends me a, a video of the atrocities, like immediately block. Like I I have zero uh, capacity bandwidth for that stuff. Um, and, and, you know, like, uh, I mean, we could debate on a philosophical level whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that people share that stuff. I mean, I do understand there's a PR element to it, but. I just feel like once you see that stuff, you can't unsee it and it just, it destroys your soul. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was, I think, you know, this whole, this whole nation is devastated, but I think, uh, you know, a person who, the people who are part of this, this club that no one asked to be part of, I think we were probably triggered, uh, you know, exponentially, uh, you know, more significantly. Um, and, and, you know, I think till now, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying my best to kind of stay above water and, focus on positivity and try to find things to grasp onto and just stay away from the, the horrible atrocities. Cause I, I cannot handle it. How far away were you from, uh, from what took place? I mean, this is Israel. We're, we're a country smaller than New Jersey, as yeah. you know. So, you know, one end to the other end is like, you know, it's six hours or something. So yeah, exactly. I would say, you know, from where I am to, to people would see where it happened. I don't know an hour. Yeah. It's nothing. When people don't understand the scale of Israel. That's one of the things I've noticed in the world. They fail to, to grasp the concept that if there's an attack in Israel, it would be the same thing as having an attack in New Jersey on that scale, not on in the United States. Right. Uh, and so the scale of reference, even in terms of loss of life, is magnitudes higher per capita than even what we right. saw on 9-11. Yep. Um, yep. You know, I, I just want to touch on what you just said that, you know, the, the philosophical arguments of, of showing it versus not showing it. The most tragic thing I've discovered in all this is the mass amounts of denial from pro-Palestinian uh, pro people. And, the you know, I can almost rationalize on some very, you know, sad, tragic level, the plight of Palestinians. And I'm not going to say justifying this attack in any way, shape or form. I find it disgusting. But from their perspective, in their heads, I've talked to a lot of Palestinians. That's fine. One, I'm going to have that conversation with them separately. But the whole world's response to it is far more scary. The fact that it wasn't just Palestinians trying to rationalize it. It's the entire world trying to rationalize it. Were you surprised yeah. by that? So it's it's an interesting question because truth is, you know, on October 8th, uh, being an optimistic kind of guy, I was like, okay, you know, 
at least now the world's going to see it. Like, there's no way, there is no scenario in which the world doesn't stand by Israel now. I mean, we have high resolution HD footage of the atrocities. No one can deny that. I mean, right? No one can deny that, or so I thought. Um, and so, on the one hand, it's kind of like, you know, I, I knew how morally bankrupt Western civilization has become, uh, but I didn't think it was going to reach these levels. And so, I did kind of, um, you know, optimistically believe that this would be a shift and, and, a, and a change. Um, so I was surprised on the one hand, but then I say to myself, why are you surprised? Like w the script is already written. I mean, yes. Okay. So it's, it's easier to deny the Holocaust because there's only X amount of survivors walking on planet earth, but like, it, you gotta be a lunatic. To, I mean, we have, you know, and so if you could deny that, you could deny this and, and yeah, I mean, it's absolute insanity. I mean, it's absolute, what, what has to happen? Like, again, high, like we have high resolution footage. They 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 are proud of it. It's not like they're saying no, it didn't happen. They're proud of it, and mm -hmm. yet the world says it didn't happen. It's it's just it's it's inconceivable. It's hard to even understand and digest. They held a, a viewing in Gaza to celebrate it for yeah. people to go watch. They it's forced the kids to watch it, dude. They forced the freaking hostages to watch it. I, I can't even. You know, when it happened, I had this conversation with my dad. He goes, no, 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 this time around, we're going to have support. We have a couple of months before the world says, all right, take it easy. And I was like, dad, it's going to take three to five days before mass protests, before violence against Jews. And it didn't even take three to five days. It took about 24 hours. That's honestly what it took. And I, I often think about what that means when you can take Hamas, who was not getting a lot of media attention, was not getting a lot of social media posts, and they can go massacre us like that. They can go massacre countless people. And the response is tremendous support for, for their cause. What does that teach them? Now they're incentivized to keep trying to do this, which is why they're openly telling the world that's what they want to do. So, yeah, I, I can't understand. It's something endemic or there's something that's happened psychologically in society. Uh, I don't know if you have any insight on it, but I've been uh, trying yeah, to... Yeah, I mean, I have insights, but it's it's super simplistic. I don't think you're going to appreciate it too much. I just think that it's just the oldest hatred in the world. I don't think... I think you're trying to read logic into something that has no logic. There's zero explanation from a rational perspective why anti-Semitism is even a thing. I mean, I don't need to tell you the amount of good that the Jewish people have done for this world is completely disproportionate to the tiny number that we are in the world population. And we've only done good for the world. Like, there is no logical explanation why Jews should be so hated. So, you know, to try to explain why the world's not standing with us is you're, you're never going to find a rational explanation. There is no rational explanation. It's just the modern day mask of anti-Semitism, you know, and it's being dis disguised as something else. This, this generation is called anti-Zionism. They can call it whatever they want. It's the same stuff as it's always been. Absolutely agree. I mean, I, I guess I didn't realize how pervasive it was or how easily some people are manipulated. I do think there's some degree of manipulation. They're not just pure anti-Semitism, but an abuse of empathy. Uh, and if you're on social media, what I see the algorithms showing them is just dead baby, dead baby, dead baby, Israel oppressor, Israel oppressor, Israel oppressor. And if you're not educated and actually looking at the history and trying to understand it fully, then of course that's the outcome you're gonna come to if you're an empathetic person. But uh, Dude, I'm gonna push back, man. I, I, I know, that's you know. fine, I want you to. I mean, again, I hear what you're saying, um, but, you know, if you're a human being with a brain and a conscience and a heart, then then you you're should be smarter, smarter than, than to just believe blindly what you're shown by the social media algorithms that are designed and built to keep you in your echo chamber. you got to be smarter than that. I'm smarter than that. You're smarter than that. You know, we see things and we question them, right? So – you know, to say, oh, you know, billions of people around the world or hundreds of millions of people around the world, all they see are dead babies and all they see is just the oppressor. So they believe it. Well, maybe maybe use your brain and maybe have a little critical thinking. And and if I may, I, I'm going to mm -hmm. get a little controversial on you right now. OK, mm -hmm. no, I want you to. I want you to be okay. honest. Is it a little controversial? And and I, I don't know. I mean, is, this isn't live, right? So you can edit it maybe. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. OK, so someone said something to me this past weekend that strongly, strongly resonated with me. And this is what he said when, you know, other issues uh, were on the table about morality in Western civilization, specifically gender issues. And the topic was call me by my pronoun. Like, what do you care? Right. That was the, that was the claim. What do you care to call me? She like if I want to identify as a piece of paper, then call me a piece of paper. What do you care? Right. That was that, that was like 
And so, okay, that's a valid argument. Like, you know, there's no price. You're not losing anything by calling me a piece of paper, by calling me a, I don't know what, you know, a telephone. Call me whatever I, I identify as a cat. Call me a cat. What do you care, right? That's a valid argument. But it isn't a valid, valid, valid argument because once you tell people that what they see in front of their face and what, and, and what they know to be real and true is no longer real and true and critical thinking should not be something that we do, we should just accept falsehoods because that's what people are telling me, then when it comes to pronouns, you're right, there's no price. But when we get rid of critical thinking, we get to a point that there's a war between good and evil and the world can't tell the difference because mm -hmm. we threw critical thinking out the window ten, five years ago when we were talking about gender issues. So, you know, this is a problem in Western civilization. It's like, is truth even a thing? Are facts even a thing? No, it's everything's just different. There's no right and wrong. There's no good and bad. It's yeah. just different. And that is the deterioration of the moral fabric of Western society. So I, I speak on this quite a bit. I did a documentary on this. And to say there's no price also for what you were just talking about, there is there is a price just of denial of objective reality. Um, but even in the moment, there's a price. So I started deep diving into that. And they, I found out they were putting men who have a history of sexually assaulting women in prison with women yeah. because yeah. they identify as women. And that there was a big movement to push this. Even Biden was trying to push more of it. California. Uh, and you had women being raped and impregnated in prison because of the denial of objective truth. It's, just, it's hard there, to believe, are, you know? Like, well, it's, it's a play on empathy again. It's, you know, it's what you just said superficially on the surface. If it makes someone feel better, why can't you? How does it affect your life? But people don't look at the long term ramifications of this. I'm just going to say something because you touched on something very important, the moral decay of Western civilization. And I think it comes down through the fact that most people nowadays, even myself included, I was inherently nihilistic before October 7th. Like I said, I didn't really, I have trouble with faith. I have trouble with a belief in God. And if there is no standard, if there is no absolute truth, because there is no God, right? Because you need God for there to be some kind of absolute ethic or absolute truth. Otherwise, everything is just morally relative. And if everything becomes morally relative, there's no such thing as a little bit of that. All things can be questioned. All things can be broken down and all things can be whatever they want to be. And so there's a decay of a, a standard value system in the United States, which I've noticed, where people no longer hold any type of value in themselves just for being alive, just for being human beings. And so they seek it. They seek it through causes, whether it's the trans cause, whether it's now the Palestinian-Israeli cause. And this is where their value is coming from. I've seen it. It's become a religion for them. They're not even involved in the region, and they're more passionate about it than I am, where my family is. Uh, so. 100%. It's total ignorance, by the way. Total ignorance. It is total ignorance. It's it's very tragic. Um, and again, there's no quick solution for that. And arguably, that's going to destroy the West much faster than anything else. There is no greater enemy to the West than these kind of uh, psychogenic epidemics that are taking place, which result in the denial of any type of objective truth. A hundred percent. But, you know, let's also not forget that this is history repeating itself. I mean, the script is already written. Like, it's all written. I mean, you just have to open a history book, right? You look throughout history. It's the same pattern over and over again. There's an empire, okay? The empire gets stronger and stronger, world domination. And as soon as they, their, their power goes to their head, morality goes out the window. They put people in the Colosseum to fight to their death with an emperor and his thumbs up or thumbs down because – who cares about human life, right? Morality is out the window. And when morality goes out the window, that society, that empire no longer wants to have old school morality shoved down their throat. And where does the world know that it's immoral to murder or to rape or any of the things that we know from the Ten Commandments, which is the Torah, which is Judaism? Now, if I don't want old school morality, I don't want you shoving you know, old school morality down my throat. I need to get rid of that morality. Now, I can't get rid of the creator of morality because mm -hmm. I can't get rid of God, but I can get rid of the messenger. You kill FedEx, you don't get your package. And we are the messengers. And so as soon as morality goes out the window, they come after the Jews who are trying to deliver them morality. And when that happens, us Jews, what do we do? We say, no, 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 no. You're confused. We're just like you. We're just like you. There's no difference between us. We're going to assimilate. In fact, not only are we just like you, but we're more German than you. We're more Greek than you. We're, we're, we are more liberal than the most liberal people in America, right? We are going to out America the Americans. And mm -hmm. then, then anti-Semitism goes through the roof because those people who we're trying to be just like say to us, no, 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 no. You're not just like us. And I'm going to remind you that you're not just like us using this tool we call anti-Semitism. Every single time, the same thing. And when it reaches that point, 
then then it hits the fan and then get things get really bad really really fast and we're there we're right there and 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 it's important to mention the the transition from dangerous rhetoric to the extermination of Jews in Europe took years here it took a month mm-hmm. a month so what's america going to look like in 3 months from now i don't even want to think about it it's terrifying uh, in terms of of being solution based do you think this is one of the things i struggle with with israel i've been, always been an optimist kind of like uh, how you said you're inherently an optimist i've always wanted to believe in coexistence i've always wanted to believe uh that there was a way for us to live side by side peacefully you know if you look objectively at all the evidence at all the polling at everything they've done at all the peace deals they've denied they that's not their goal and so long as that's not their goal there's no opportunity for that so what what's your belief on that well i, I i'm gonna maybe take what you're saying and 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 maybe uh strengthen it and say that it's not just not their goal it is the antithesis of their goal it is their kryptonite right go look uh, listen this isn't a matter of opinion. The charter is on the internet. Go read it, right? The Palestinian Authority, the PLO, was established for there to be no Israel. Mm-hmm. Right? Hamas wants to kill not Israelis, Jews, not only in Israel. In fact, not only Jews, infidels, anyone who's not radical Islam deserves to die. Okay, so mm-hmm. like we need to open up. This isn't just like, oh, they don't really want people. No, no, no. Th- their existence, literally the existence of the PLO and the Palestinian Authority and Hamas and Islamic Jihad and the rest of them their existence is that we don't that, that we should not be here. Mm-hmm. Meaning, if there's no Israel, they have no right to exist. That is what they're here for. So, you know, to, to, to even the, the the very discussion about coexistence is is absurd. It's naive and absurd. I think the fundamental problem that uh, I think exists here in this war, but but beyond, is that you know, as Westerners, we have these core values that we were brought up with, and we believe to like to our to the depths of our soul. You know, if I treat you with respect, you're going to treat me with respect. It's just like a basic rule of life. And so in the West, we know that so deeply. And so, you know, fundamentally that we take those values and we copy paste them onto radical Islam. But radical Islam does not share those values with us. Mm -hmm. They don't. the, The concept of treat me well and I'll treat you well. That's not something they believe in. If you're an infidel, you could treat me as well as you want. I don't need to tell you how many peace activists were murdered on October 7th, right? All of those kibbutzim, they're, they were as far left as it goes. They were the people trying to help the Palestinian cause. They dedicated their lives to it. So, you know, the whole concept of, of peace, it's just, it's a ridiculous thing. And I don't know, I think it was, I don't know if it was Einstein or someone else said, if you keep repeating the same thing and expect a different result, you're an idiot, right? Yeah. I mean, the amount of times that we've offered them a state, forget us, the UN, when we got a state, they got a state. And they said yeah. no. So like. They don't want to stay. They want dead Jews. They say it. We. It's time we believe them. And, and, and you know, the list of, like, ironic things about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is very, very long. But I think the most foundational one is, like, the same people that are saying they don't really mean that they want to murder you. Come on, don't, don't listen to them. Okay, they voted for Hamas, but they don't need to be held accountable for their actions. Come on, they're just, they're just a bunch of angry kids. Are the same people that's saying let's give them a state because they're a nation. Like, mm-hmm. dude, make up your mind. If they're a nation that deserves a state, then they are a nation to be held accountable for their actions. They elected Hamas, period, full stop, end of story. There's nothing else to talk about. If there are people that deserve a state, they need to be treated as a people. And we know what happens when a nation elects a, you know, dictatorship, a.k.a. Nazi Germany. There's no discussion about how many innocent people are killed. You denazify Germany. And that means many innocent people lost their lives. But when you're eliminating evil, you need to eliminate evil. And it comes at a cost. And you know what? War sucks. And we didn't want this. It was brought upon, it was forced upon us. And now we need to do what we need to do. We need to stop with the, you know, the victim card and the victim talk of like, no, let's make peace with they don't want peace with us. They want us dead. That's it. Well, I, I I fully agree with you. I mean, even going back to prior, you know, people keep talking about, oh, from the river to the sea, we're just talking about freedom for everyone. I'm like, but that literally comes from the PLO pre-occupation, pre-everything you claim you're fighting for, for the very call for the end of Israel. And just objectively speaking, you're holding up a map showing all of Israel as Palestine and then saying intifada, intifada after it. And you're telling me that your goal is not violence. You are literally calling for violence, showing me a map of erasing Israel while calling making a call, a chant, that a government who, or group who actively wanted to destroy Israel prior to any occupation was calling for. So it's completely, these people just don't know what they're doing. They're just completely lost in terms of their ability to think uh, rationally anymore. It's just, it's so odd. 
Um, again, again, you're going back to the rational thing. It's not about them not being able to think rationally. It's about them hating Jews and being blinded by their hatred. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that in 1929, before there was a state of Israel, let alone any occupation, Arabs were massacring Jews in Hebron. That's a historical fact. What were they massacring us about? What, what were they fighting about? They're fighting about occupation that's going to come in 40 years? Like, come on already. The narratives are so ridiculous, and it's so obvious that otherwise intelligent and moral people, when it comes to Israel, it's like Steve Jobs had a reality distortion field. They have this Jew distortion field. And whenever it comes with anything to do with Jews or Israelis, logic is out the window. It's just pure hatred. It's it's unbelievable to see as someone who grew up my whole life saying never again. And even as I said those words, I said to myself, I don't even know why you're even like saying this. It's so obvious. It could never happen again. And here we are. So we need to understand that Jew hatred is Jew hatred. It just takes on a new mask every generation. Well, yeah, never again was something uh, I always used to say, yeah, governments can become corrupt, this and that. But I never felt it truly that hey, as a Jew, this much of the world really would be okay with me disappearing. And how many of them would actually take part in it is the question. Uh, something that really pisses me off, and I don't know how you're going to respond to this, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts, is uh, you're talking about kind of we're going to be more liberal than the most liberal Americans. Uh, that's tremendously worked against us. I don't understand the mentality of the liberal Jew, self-hating, hates Israel, anti-Zionist Jew. It's such a phenomenon to me. And it's not like there's a small amount. I mean, there. I'm sure there is, you know, in terms of statistically out of all the Jews in the world, they probably represent less than three to five percent of the, the Jewish population. But they're very vocal. And it's just a weird phenomenon. The very liberal Jews are, I would say, in the United States, represent the majority of Jews. I don't know if they're anti-Israel, but uh, the anti-Zionist Jews are probably a smaller percentage. What is that phenomenon? Where did that, you know? OK, so now, now we're now we're going to have to go deep. <laughs> OK. Um, I mean, again, history. We got to look at history. Let's look at the history of the Jewish people. Okay, I'm sure you you are familiar with the story of ancient Egypt. We're we're enslaved in ancient Egypt for 210 years. God comes, he performs 10 miraculous plagues. He freaking brings like the craziest, like uh, unbelievable open miracles, and he says to the Jews, "Get out of here." What percentage of the Jews would you have expected to leave after he performed? Open miracles and told them to leave. What percent of the Jews would you have expected to leave Egypt? All of them. All of them. Do you know, <laughs> yeah. what, you know, you know what percent left? No. Twenty. Really? Well, that explains 80, it. <laughs> that explains 80, it. Eighty. Eighty percent of the Jews. Eighty percent of the Jews stayed in Egypt. You know why? Because they said, "I was born here. My father, my parents were born. My grand. This is my home. I have a roof, a roof above my heads. I got, I got, I got food on the table. What? Why would I leave?" So what if I'm, I'm enslaved? Come on, who cares? They 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 don't really hate us. Come on, they're gonna they're gonna have my back. We're, we're like it's it's an unbelievable phenomenon that we see throughout our history. And forget it wasn't just ancient Egypt. I mean, we're in the desert. God again performing miracles, like freaking food coming from the sky with clouds of glory around us, and we're being guided by literally by God. Okay, and He says to us, "Go into the land of Israel." And we're like, you know, wait, oh, not so fast. Let me just send. And 12 spies to you know check out the land. And 12 spies that were the leaders of the nation, 12 of the biggest rabbis of the generation, go in and 10 come back and they say, no, no, no good. We're staying in the desert. What the <laughs> hell is that about? What the hell is that about? I'll tell you what it's about. It's the same thing we're doing today. What are the religious or the ultra-Orthodox Jews in America saying? Going to Israel? My kid, my kid might go off the derech, you know, he might become less religious, less. I'd rather stay here in my Lakewood and my Muncie and my whatever. This is what the, that's exactly what happened in the desert. These 10 rabbis, they're like, listen, I'm in the desert. I got a direct line of communication with God. I got everything I need here spiritually. I'm going to go into this strange land and build an economy and an army and leave me the hell alone. man. I want to, I want to be spiritual. And this is what we're doing again today. We repeat these things over and over. We just don't see what's in front of our eyes. I mean, you know, at the splitting of the sea. I mean, what could be more obvious that God did all of those miracles? He brought us to the sea. And you think like they'd be like, okay, I mean, obviously God's going to perform a miracle right now because he didn't bring us here to kill us. What do they do? They turn to God. They say, what did you do to us? Why did you take us out of Egypt? We were so good over there. Are you guys like mentally challenged? Like what is wrong with us? This is yeah. what we do every freaking generation. This is what we're doing right now. I mean, you know, the, the, the things that we're seeing in this war it's. I know it's hard to say because it's obviously devastating and it's horrible, but 
if you take a step back, and it's hard to do, but if you take a step back and look at this war more as a historical perspective, you will see miracles the likes of the splitting of the sea. I mean, I could list the, the list is very, very long, but let's just start with the most most fundamental. And it's and I'm sorry if this is gonna offend you. I'm sure people listening will be offended what I'm about to say, but hypothetically speaking, okay, let's take a step back. If I would tell you that 3,000 terrorists would march into a country smaller than New Jersey with unlimited access to sophisticated weapons and automatic weapons and six to eight hours of free hand to do whatever they want, how many people would you expect them to have been have been murdered that day? 50,000? Yeah, 100,000? Yeah. I think half of Israel would have been wiped out. They only, and again, it's a horrible thing to say, they only killed 1,200 people. You know why? Because they were pigs and they were savages and they were barbaric, horrible things that they did. But had they not done that, half the country would be wiped out. So can you say that's a miracle? That's a horrible thing to say. But again, Purim, we celebrate Purim. Like Purim was the near genocide of the Jewish people. Here we are drinking and getting dressed up, but think about what it felt like back then. Or Hanukkah, same thing. We just celebrated Hanukkah. Dude, there was no way we were winning that war. No way. And we won. So at the time, they were like, oh my God, we're, we're destroyed. The, the whole nation's good. Here we are celebrating. So, you know, it's very hard to see it now, but you know, when you hear about these rockets falling in open areas, dude, Israel is a freaking speck on the map. Where are these open areas? Like, yeah, know, so we just I know. Take it as a, oh, open area. These are miracles, man. Miracles. Well, the amount of rockets thrown, people don't know this, but I mean, even on an average year, you look at uh, 2022 prior to all of this, there were over 2,000 rockets fired in one year. Very few of them managed. And even aside from Iron Dome, the ones who make it through Iron Dome tend not to hit people. There's just an extreme yeah. luck or whatever, God's protection. There's some kind of phenomenon there. Even the wars that Israel has won since its inception, since 1948, are statistically, and especially if you look at the casualties and just kind of how they've played out, are miracles very much in themselves. There's uh, And the fact that Hezbollah didn't decide to join in on this, if it was a little bit more orchestrated and Lebanon got involved, if they did it on the same day, Israel would have been done. I don't think there's a way they could have uh, dealt with that. Yeah. Uh, so this could have been much, much worse. Uh, not to say that it wasn't incredibly bad, but there was a certain degree of uh, God's grace, protection, something there. Bro, bro you know, you, you talk about the Iron Dome, as we all do, as if it's a normal thing. Like, do you understand that when Dr. Daniel Gold invented the Iron Dome, he went to the military, he went to the government, he went to the U.S., everyone told him it is impossible mm -hmm. to detonate a rocket midair. Like, mm -hmm. this is... It is a technological wonder, but it is a miracle. This is something that in no one in, like you talk about the wars, find me one military strategist in the world who can explain how Israel won the Six Day War. There's no such thing. Doesn't no, exist. I know. That's that's a like, real uh, real enigma. <laughs> right. So I'm saying, but we, but, but we don't see it. Like we have these yeah. these uh, you know these. Uh, and I'm, by the way, to be clear, I'm not judging anyone. You know, I, I came here as a kid. I didn't sacrifice anything. But like, I talked to my friends in the states. Like, what the hell are you waiting for? Like, what has to happen? Like, uh, you know, we talk about the writing on the wall, about the German Jews. How did they not leave? Dude, are you, like, you can't even see the wall anymore. There's so much writing. What the hell are you waiting for? It's it's like it's like we are just blind. We, we do, Every generation, we just don't see in front of our eyes. It's crazy. You know, it's interesting you said we, we look at the Iron Dome and we don't think about it. But uh, all the Israel haters out there. The very fact that Israel's only chance at existence is having the most sophisticated anti-rocket defense system in the entire world that is decades ahead of anyone else's because there are over 2,000 rockets on an average year lobbed, lobbied? What's the word? Just thrown at it in the hopes of killing civilians. Right. That sums up the debate right there. You know, if Israel was just throwing 2,000 rockets blindly at civilians every year in Gaza and the West Bank, there would be no more Palestinians. There would be yeah, you know, hundreds of thousands dead every year. It's such a hypocrisy that, there again. Yeah, th there's that list again. There's the list again of, of, of ironic things in this war. It's like, Israel, you're so strong. This is disproportionate. Come on, the, the Palestinians, they're so weak. They're, come on, you can't. But also, you're, 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 you're shooting indiscriminately. Dude, if we, if we are so strong and we're firing indiscriminately, don't you think Gaza would be flattened by now? Like I, I've said that to people before. They don't. You know, get it's it. like make up your freaking mind, man. Are we strong? Are we not strong? Are we taking you know minimizing civilian casualties? Are we not minimizing civilian? They just play both sides, and it's just it's just one contradiction after the other. The whole thing is one big 
false narrative the whole war from beginning to end it's crazy well that's what that moral relativism allows for it's genocide even though the population's gone up 10 times since 1948 yeah. it's gone up three exactly. times since 2000 or 2005 i mean there's just again there, there's complete it's apartheid even though 20 percent of israel is is muslim palestinian with full equal rights none of it matters as long as you say the word enough times that's what matters uh, i want to talk to you now if you just have 10 more minutes about being like Essentially, it's, my big struggle with this is then what's the solution? You know, what is the final outcome? You're saying coexistence is not an option. I sadly do agree on a, on a very human level. Um, let's first talk about just this situation here. Israel gets rid of Hamas. Uh, Gaza is left without a government. Does Israel reoccupy Gaza? Do they make some kind of agreement with surrounding Arab states that they were in the Abraham Accords with to come in and do some kind of group government? What's What's the real solution here for, for post-war? I'll start by saying there is not a human being on planet Earth that I would less want to be in their shoes than Netanyahu right now. I mean, I, I can't imagine the guy sleeps at night with everything that's on his, you know, it's all on his shoulders right now. You know, what's going to be the day after? Uh, luckily, I'm not a politician or a military strategist, so I don't really have to have an answer to that question. But if we're talking hypothetically, I, I really can answer the question, what what cannot be the day after? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But I do know that what Elon Musk suggested, that we, you know, we give them the ability to prosper and to build a, you know, a, 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 an affluent society and we re-educate. Like, dude, Mr. Musk, I love you, man. A lot of respect, mad respect. But, dude, you're, you're living in la-la land, okay? You can't, you can't kill an ideology when you are indoctrinated by that ideology from age zero, Okay. They don't care about affluence. You, you mentioned my brother. Ari's Ari's murderer was a 16-year-old Palestinian kid living an affluent life as much as me and as much as you. He lacked nothing in his life. It's not about, you know, like you said, it's not about oppression. It's not about, it's all one big false narrative to cover up their real agenda of murdering Jews. And so, you know, to say that we, we can, you know, re-educate, it's not happening. It's not going to happen. And, and every day that we waste, you know, spreading that narrative is just another day lost. And so- you know, I, I, there are many, I guess, suggestions out there. None of them are particularly realistic. I mean, if you'd ask me, if I was right now, you know, I don't know, prime minister or the head of the army, uh, what I would do, honestly, and, and again, super, super controversial, super not politically correct, but here we are. Um, I would I would continue to bombard the freaking hell out of Gaza to the point of unprecedented humanitarian crisis. And just when it gets to the end and the world says cease fire. I accidentally drop a shell on the border between e Egypt and Gaza, and the two million starving Gazans walk right into Egypt. Egypt can't do squat because they're not going to fire two million people. Egypt is weaker dim diplomatically than they've ever been. They cannot do anything. Get two, th two million starving Gazans right into Egypt. Come in we come into Gaza. We split Gaza up the way we're doing right now. Slowly but surely, rebuild a society with built-in incentives, you know, so that it is... It doesn't, it doesn't pay to be affiliated with terror. We take complete security control like we have in Judea and Samaria, what the world likes to call the West Bank. They can have their own towns. They can have their own mayors, but we have security control. You pick up a gun, we're there. End of story. Like we are in Janine, like we are in Shechem, like we are we're, we're throughout Judea and Samaria. To me, I can't think of another solution besides that. Is that realistic? I mean, yes and no. On the one hand, like how could you do that? You know, put 2 million people in a, in a situation of starvation and whatever. But on the other hand, that's what they're saying we're doing anyway. <laughs> like, so well, you know, so I, that's I, the, that's the big debate. There, there's some point I had a conversation with my friend, and the, the big question I've always had for Israel for many years now is: Israel inevitably, just based on birth rates and based on certain statistic realities, will not remain a democracy forever. That's just something people have to accept. Eventually, the the Muslim population will become the majority just by world standards. And I think it's going to happen in Europe. It's going to happen in the United States. It's going to eventually going to happen everywhere, just based on birth rates. And Israel cannot exist as a majority Islamic state. It's no longer Israel. Jews are no longer safe. And we've seen this. My own family had it in Iraq. Like you said, in the 1920s, there were pogroms against the Jews in Israel before it was a state and greater mandate of Palestine. Almost every year, not just in 1929, I researched it. There were pogroms much more than people talk about. Um, and so there's a long-term reality there where people accuse Israel of being apartheid, but there is some point where it does become apartheid just based on the reality of self-preservation. Uh, there's certain immoral outcomes that are justified due to self-preservation at some point. It's a very interesting psychological phenomenon. Let's say the United States, if you knew the face of the United States, the freedoms, 
of the United States, everything the country is based on, would be destroyed because of those very rights and tolerant standards that we have for democracy, for voting. And that those very people who you are tolerant for would come in and take away those very rights in that democracy so, so that you could never vote again on them. Uh, would you do whatever it took to stop that? And it's a weird, it's a weird thing. Where's the point? Where's the point where you look and you say, this will destroy our nation. We have to do something to stop it. Right. So it brings me back to what I said before, which is we need to stop taking our values of democracy, of all the freedoms that we give and applying it to radical Islam because their definition of, you know, of, of freedoms is annihilating all infidels. So we need to stop. We need to say, I'm sorry, we have these core values. You clearly do, do not have those core values. So you have two options. You either adopt our core values or get the hell out of my country. End of story. How are we going to get rid of them logistically? I don't know. But if a person is not willing to live in my country by my law and live peacefully without terrorizing my country, then it is, in my, in my opinion, our right, my right, to make sure that that does not continue. How to do that? Again, I don't have a practical solution. You can't just kick people out of your country. I don't know. But you're 100% right. If we continue down this road of giving them freedom, they're going to grow. They're going to now you know, come and outvote, vote us out, basically, and just take over every country. So we can't allow that to happen. I don't know how to prevent that, but that can happen, obviously. Yeah, I mean, and polling proves it. I mean, just the amount who want to live under Sharia, when you look at European, uh, and it's it's sad because I'm, you know, again, I'm kind of like, I try and be an empathetic, ethical person and moral person. And so when you see these these stats, these polling numbers, 99% of, of Muslims in Arab countries to 100% in some countries, held very anti-Semitic views. That's not anti-Israel views. They held anti-Semitic views. They had very, very negative views of Jews. And you're telling me those are the people who should rule us. That's what everyone says. Just let them rule you. They, they'll be, you can have, you can live under a majority Muslim state. You did it for, for thousands of years, you know, or whatever, 1500 years, ever since the, the birth of Islam. How old is Islam? It's about 1500 years, right? Whatever, but uh, they, uh, th that's what they say. Your family was fine in Iraq. I'm like, no, my family had to escape Iraq. That's literally what had to happen. Uh, kind of a sad ending to this because I, <laughs> you know, there, it's it's almost like every time I have these conversations, I've spoken to Palestinian people and they tell me to my face, no, there's no chance at coexistence. And I'm like, well, then what is that? What does that mean for everyone? What is the well, what is the end game here for everyone? It's just a weird. Okay. All it takes is them saying, hey, we want to live beside you peacefully. That's all it would well, take. Bro, listen, you mentioned faith a few times throughout this discussion. Um, so you want to end on a, on a positive note. Let me let me let me share some of my thoughts on faith with you. All right. So first of all, uh, you know, this past Torah portion this week, literally, uh, it's the story of Joseph and his brothers, how they sell him to slavery because they're jealous of him and whatever. And they sell him to slavery. And he then grow, you know, um, uh, climbs up the ranks in Egypt, becomes the second in command to, to Pharaoh. And then there's a, 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 you know, a famine, there's no food and his brothers come down to Egypt and he has to give them food, but he's dressed like an Egyptian and they don't recognize him at all. He recognizes them. And the Torah, literally the verse in the Torah says, Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Mm -hmm. And Rabbi Sachs, the former uh, head uh, rabbi of, of the UK, uh, explained that is our history. That is our history. The world just won't recognize us. They just won't. And that is the reality. And so you, you have to, and this is, again, my opinion, and I think it would be helpful for you as a person if you maybe shifted your perspective a, a little bit and realize that not this war, not this conflict, and much of not this world makes any ra rational sense. There's no logic in any of it. And so for me, what, what, what makes my life easier is that I at some point say, listen, you know, it's out of my hands. It's just, I can't, if I try to rationalize this and I try to look at this through a human lens, I will lose my mind, okay? So, you know, why God does what he does? I mean, I can tell you a simplistic analogy that really helps me, but it's, it's, a, very, it's a very childish, simplistic analogy, but it, but it resonates with me. And I'll tell you what I think. And this is, this is really what I think. You know, you go, you take an infant to the doctor to get a shot. That infant looks up at you and says, dad, why are you stabbing me with a needle? Are you insane? What kind of father stabs his son with a needle? But you as an adult realize your son needs the shot. To your son, this infant, there is nothing you can say in any way, shape, or form that will convince them that it is normal to stab your son with a needle, okay? But we understand that that is what he needs. And so that is the way I view things. I don't know why we needed a shot. I don't know why God does what he does. But I believe my faith is that God does things for a reason. 
generally speaking throughout history, as history unfolded, we understood why things happened. But at the end of the day, the bottom line for me is that I don't know the road. I don't know the path, but I do know that it's a happy ending. I know it's a happy ending because of this thing on my head, right? And that's what I believe. And so no matter you know how hard of a day I'm having, no matter if, you know, God forbid we lose 10 soldiers and I just don't know what to do with the amount of sadness in my heart, I just remind myself that the Jewish people, the fact that we're here, like is just completely illogical, makes no sense. And here we are at the splitting of the sea. And I'm looking at God and saying, how could you do this to me? Instead of saying, look what he's done for us till today. Clearly, he's going to split the sea for us. Clearly, we're going to win this war. Clearly, it's going to be a good ending. How? I don't know. I'm standing at the sea. Uh, the Egyptians are behind me and the sea is in front of me. I don't, I don't even see a scenario in which I get out of this. But he, that's what he does. He, he works you know, his miracles when we need them most. And so I, I believe the ending's a good ending. I don't know the pathway, but I do believe that the, the sea is splitting right before our eyes. We just need to recognize it. That's how I view things. Well, that's a great way to look at it. Um, and I'll try and I'll, I'll try and have that kind of faith moving forward. <laughs> I got to learn to have the kind of faith you have. I do think the Abraham Accords could help the Middle East tremendously and at least create some kind of uh, partnership with other states that could grow to. Uh, you're seeing it. You're seeing a change in how they view us and how they view uh, Israel, how they view America, just because the Abraham Accords went a long way. Um, but I appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, Definitely uh, was nice having someone speak so <laughs> so honestly, but it's just you know it's hard to hear. It's hard to hear the the certain bro, happening. bro. I just again, I I don't even want to call it faith because you know if you if you're if you not you, but if a person has integrity and a person's intelligent enough to open history books and look at the Jewish people and the history of the Jewish people, like where are the ancient Greeks? Where are the ancient Egyptians? Where are the Nazis? Where are the Romans? Where are these people? They're all gone. They were the leading empires of the world. They're all gone. And here we are, this tiny little nation of 14 million people that is a 0.02 percentage of the world population. And meanwhile, we're dominating in all sectors of the entire Western world from innovation to medicine to, to Nobel Prizes. It doesn't make any sense. The Jewish people make no sense. So if you look at it objectively, truly objectively, you don't really have to have faith. It's so obvious. It's so obvious that we are a supernatural phenomenon. We just are. There's no logical, no historian can tell you statistically why we should be here. We shouldn't, and we are. So forget faith. Just like look at history. It's clear that we are going to survive this. It's clear we're going to win this. And it's clear that in 50 years from now or 100 years from now or whatever, we're going to celebrate. We are going to dance again on Simchat Torah with our Torah scrolls, and we are going to celebrate this victory just like we celebrate every other holiday in the Jewish calendar that was originally a horrible tragedy for the Jewish people. Without exception, it's the same thing. They tried to kill us, we won, and now we eat. That's the, that's the story of the Jewish people right there.